All right, in this lecture, we're going to try and tie together the different components of the confessions we've been discussing and give us a, a trajectory on Augustine's life after the confessions. Now, we had talked about the story theory template balance, cataclysmic event, rising action, climax, falling action, return to balance. Okay. Um, Augustine is crafting this text in order to fit story theory. This was written some 30 years after the uh, events described. This is not Augustine's diary. This is Augustine reflecting back in time as a mature Christian. Okay, so he is intentionally selecting some things to be included, some things not to be included. It's not a memoir. Okay, it is a spiritual autobiography, and I have to say, he is the person that invented the genre. I mean, there were biographies before Augustine, but there was never the sort of soul-searching, autobiographical, uh, intellectual uh, self-portrait that we see in Augustine's Confessions before he wrote it. We have an entire section of this in Barnes Noble today, but when Augustine wrote the Confessions, this was the only one. This was it. Um, but that didn't mean that he did not have templates from which he worked. Uh, he was influenced by, um, by, by epic poetry. We see some elements of the I need in here. He was influenced by a genre of literature called protrapasis, which is like wisdom literature. It, it tried to get the reader to respond a certain way. One of the best examples of, of this is a book that we don't have. Cicero's Hortensius was protrapasis, that you read the Hortensius and you were motivated to pursue wisdom. Uh, Augustine wrote his confessions as a version of protrapasis, that when we read it, we are motivated to respond a certain way. So we have to ask ourselves, how did Augustine want us to respond? What is the most important aspect of the confessions? And I think story theory can, can help us figure that out. Now, a bunch of theologians and literary scholars have written a lot on what they believe the climax of the confessions to be. A lot of people consider it uh, in book seven, his conversion to Neoplatonism, for two reasons. Number one, this seems to be a, a pivotal point in the story. It tends to be one of the longer chapters. There are 13 total chapters in the Confessions, so it balances out neatly that there are six chapters, six chapters with um, chapter seven being the centerpiece of it. Uh, other scholars think it's book nine and this beatific vision where Augustine finally gets to uh, touch the outside of, of, of God, so to speak, that he has been kind of working towards this for a while and that's when it's finally realized. Uh, I want to argue that the climax of the Confessions is really book eight, his conversion. Okay? So if we understand the balance as being uh, a sinful life and the cataclysmic event is reading the Hortensius and embarking on this quest towards wisdom in the same way that Frodo embarked on a quest to rid the world, the world of the one reign. Um, where does that quest end? What is the result of that quest? Uh, we see Augustine going through various philosophical attempts to find rest, attempts to find wisdom. And um, he tries Manichaeism, tries astrology, he tries academic skepticism, he tries Neoplatonism, but where his quest ended is when he found Christianity. And the reason why I believe that conversion is the climax of this, is what everything in the, in the book is pointed to, is the inclusion of the stories about Monica. Okay? Monica uh, Augustine could have told his story without including what mom was doing, especially when you look at the fact that mom was not necessarily helping him. Like mom was making him look bad earlier, or early on, right? He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, mom was constantly telling him that he's wrong. Um, mom f uh, followed him to another country without telling him. 
Uh, mom was doing the embarrassing things that moms do. But what was it throughout that Monica was pursuing? And that was Augustine's conversion. And when Augustine finally did convert, his fr the first thing he records is going and telling his mother. So we have the interjection of Monica uh, and her vision of Monica, Monica and talking with the, the pastor, um, Monica and talking with the Bishop Ambrose, that Monica keeps popping up for no reason other than to remind people that she is praying for Augustine's conversion. And then when Augustine is converted, the rest of book eight and books eight and nine is really about not just Augustine, but Augustine and Monica. So book eight in my mind is the fulfillment of not only his quest for wisdom and that, that passage on, you know, uh, I, I have found her, you know, I have, I have found wisdom. Wisdom is eternal and equates wisdom with God. Um, and the celebrations that he has with his mother, Monica, uh, in my mind, convinces me that book eight and the conversion story is Augustine's climax. Now, if this is Protrepace's literature and our job is to react appropriately to the story, what's the appropriate response here? The appropriate response here is conversion. This is, to one extent or another, in my mind, an evangelistic track. This is an exhortation to his own people uh, that you should be converted to, that you can be a member of a couple of different philosophical schools, but that's not the, the point. It's, do you have a relationship in Christ? And according to Augustine, the philosophical context that makes that uh, available is Neoplatonism. Uh, that, uh, I don't know if what I just offered you is a widely accepted view. I can tell you many other scholars that Uh, a medieval professor which sees Monica purely as a, a symbol of the church um, and she hasn't really defended that one uh, to me but my thesis that book eight is the climax is a research paper I wrote for her and she did not fail me so I guess I'm not that far off off the mark with that but uh, as far as I can tell that's somewhat of a, an original contribution to this uh, whole discussion on on the confessions and yes I'll admit it paints Augustine in a very evangelical light Augustine is proto-evangelical uh, and I believe he is but um, you know there there's a lot of of debate about that uh, this autobiography of Augustine was revolutionary was life-changing but it was not even really the biggest thing that Augustine did. Because we've talked about Augustine as a sinful infant and bad student. We've talked about Augustine as a philosopher and a rhetorician. We've talked about Augustine as a Christian. Uh, the last phase of Augustine's life was Augustine as bishop. Augustine's writings on Christianity developed a reputation and he was kind of, let's just say, invited to become uh, the bishop at Hippo and back in Northern Africa when, when, when he returned there. And this was a critical time in, in the life of Christianity in the Roman Empire. This was at the end of the Roman Empire. The barbarians were knocking on the, the door pretty much everywhere, including North Africa. The Franks were already in North Africa. Uh, it, and there were a number of core issues that Christians were debating. And Augustine as bishop was able to solve some of these problems. One of these problems, uh, what's known as the Donatist controversy, is what do we do with all these Christians in the age of Diocletian who renounced Christianity, made an offering to the emperor, and then when Christianity is legal again, they want to come back into the church. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of Christians were, you know, understandably upset about that. Wait a minute, I risked my life. I risked my family's life. I knew, I, I have friends and family members that died because they would not sacrifice to the emperor. 
and you just want to come back in here like that's okay uh oh um those were the donatists and um augustine took the opposite approach he said hey look peter upon which jesus built his church he denied god well if god can forgive peter and accept peter well why can't he accept these people uh, and it was the Augustinian approach that won out. Uh, another controversy was about um, free will versus determinism, um, Pelagianism, a a as it was, was, was known. And Augustine's response to Pelagianism became kind of the MO of the church, even through our, our day. Uh, probably one of the biggest questions that Augustine had to address was, okay, Christianity is the religion of our land, and it's centered in Rome, and now Rome is about ready to be defeated. What does this mean for me as a Christian? And in a very thick and dense text, uh, the City of God, Augustine went through a lot of these issues as to how Christianity relates to the state and where and how that all works. And there's a city of God and a city of man. Uh, and these are not physical cities. These are not, this is not Rome and Jerusalem and Carthage. These are spiritual states. And if you are within a certain spiritual state, it doesn't matter what earthly city survives or doesn't survive. The city of God is not Rome herself. So our job as Christians is not necessarily to protect Rome at all costs, but to protect our citizenship in another kingdom at all costs. Um, and that helped a lot of Christians to take a deep breath and say, oh, okay, well, you know, if the, the Ostrogoths do take Rome, you know, our faith will keep going. That's, the, you know, that's good to know. Um, Augustine and the Neoplatonic framework became the model by which Christianity articulated itself for hundreds of years. It isn't until we get to Aquinas that we really have a, a competing framework for understanding our Christian faith. And when we talk about Aquinas, we'll talk about how Aquinas articulated the Christian faith within, uh, intentionally within an Aristotelian framework, and how that these two um, frameworks, the Platonic and the Aristotelian, continue to be attention in our church uh, today but it is a great example of the influence that guys like Plato and Aristotle have on how we understand our faith like we said about the about the Manichees that um, bad theory leads to bad practice so it's not all about what you do you, you, you do have to spend some time in knowing that you're you're, you're thinking rightly about the world around you uh, and even for the Christian, this should involve a discussion of Plato and Aristotle. Um, different Christians have different understandings about the role of philosophy in, in the Christian life, and uh, we've addressed that somewhat uh, with Clement of Alexandria and, and, and Tertullian, but uh, uh, you got to do something with philosophy. you got to do something. Everyone's a philosopher, whether or not you are a good philosopher, whether or not you're intentionally thoughtful about it, or if it just remains in a subconscious or unconscious uh, part of your life, that's one thing, but everyone's a philosopher. Hopefully these lectures will help you clarify what you believe about philosophy or what flavor of philosophy and allow you to articulate your Christian faith more intentionally through it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.